Isaiah 41, the last part of verse 4. These words, I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am He. After the sermon, we will sing Psalm 76, the stanzas 4 and 5. And the theme for the sermon is that the Lord summons the nations to draw near for judgment, and he does so to demonstrate, first, who controls the course of history, and secondly, who concludes the course of history. Dear brothers and sisters, in our Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it amazing how the Lord cares for us so wonderfully every day of our life? Here we are, several weeks into a new year, the year of our Lord 2024. And all we can say is praise the Lord. He gives us comfort and joy strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, even in the midst of all the trials, troubles, and challenges we face. The Lord permits us to delight in the delicacies of His grace in Christ. Now, of course, this does not mean we ignore the disturbing, distressing, and disgusting, disgusting things happening on our little planet. Perhaps the word tension is best describing what goes on across the globe. There are cries far beyond what we know that come from those who suffer as they are ravaged by war, rape, assault, oppression, and by the tyranny of dictatorial regimes. Even in our own country, many people are on edge, worried about the future. Yet as we ponder what this means going forward, there's no need to let fear dominate our lives. Why not? We have the gospel. And the reason the gospel is so powerful is that it is no mere human invention. It emanates from the very throne of God. It is powerful because it is God's gospel. And what a God he is. The prophet Isaiah paints a breathtaking picture of who the Lord is in the verses leading up to our text. We didn't read this. But in chapter 40, verse 12 through 26, the prophet speaks of him as the one who created the universe as effortly as a skilled craftsman constructing a model on his workbench. He is infinitely wise, totally sovereign, worthy of more worship than we could ever give him. He is unmatched in glory and enthroned above the circle of the earth. Lift up your eyes, says Isaiah. See who it is who has given you his word to comfort and strengthen you. Have you not heard? Have you not known? The Lord is the everlasting God who gives strength to the weary and to those who wait on him. He carries them on eagles' wings. Oh, in those days, too, there was plenty going on to discourage the people of God. The future looked dim and grim. The prophets of the Lord warned Judah of defeat, destruction, and deportation at the hands of their enemies as punishment for their disobedience and rebellion. 
And the danger was that in these circumstances, the faithful remnant would forget what the Lord is like. And you know it for yourselves, don't you? Any confession of trust in the Lord and waiting on Him sounds hollow when your world is falling apart. How much comfort do you receive from believing in God when your future seems unsure and unpredictable? The people of Judah faced superpowers who threatened from the north and southwest and east. Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon were formidable forces. Indeed, to God, they are like a drop out of a bucket. But to a people who are the victims of their aggression, the power play of the nations conjured up dread and made reliance on the Lord seem silly and ridiculous. Well, to settle the minds of those disturbed by what was going on in the world, the Lord makes it perfectly clear who is sovereign in his rule over all the earth. The peoples of the earth may plot and scheme and attempt to cut their own path, but it is pointless. No point in history is controlled by any of them. The Lord wants his people to envision this scene. The nations of the world coming before him for judgment. And how impressive that would be. Put that in today's political language. Imagine if all the countries that are part of the United Nations or the G20 were summoned to come to a meeting arranged by the Lord. Would that not stun the world and comfort the saints? Well, something like this is portrayed in Isaiah 41. The nations of the world, including the distant coastlands, are called to draw near before the Lord and to do so in silence. The superpowers, the underdeveloped and occupied countries the traders and the merchants from the coastlands, they all receive a summons to come before the Lord and to shut up and listen. For years, nations clamored to have their voices heard and their presence known. They wielded their power in an attempt to be the greatest. But the Lord says to them, listen to me in silence and let me have my say and when I am done asking my questions then you may speak and notice how the Lord immediately contests the strength of the nations the previous chapter ended with a beautiful promise those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength But that cannot be said of those who do not wait for the Lord and who do not trust in Him. They are powerless before the judge of all the earth. The nations of the world may muster together all their strength, even unite forces, but they will not be able to stand before the Lord when He appears in the splendor of His majesty. He will break them in pieces with a rod of iron. And having challenged the nations to show their strength, the Lord directs them to a number of events that will take place sometime in the future, displaying his sovereign rule over all nations and peoples, all rulers and superpowers. The Lord asks, Who stirred up one from the east, whom victory meets at every step? He gives up nations before him so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them and passes on safely by paths his feet have not trod. 
Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon were the leading powers when these words were spoken. Assyria has already been on a rampage. And soon Babylon will be in control of the then known world. And yet the Lord comes with some shocking news to convey concerning the future. In a faraway and distant land, there is a tribe of farmers, unknown and insignificant on the political scene. And in time, a strong and energetic leader will become the ruler of this tribe. And he will unite a number of other tribes and make them into a strong army. At this point, Isaiah does not mention who this person is. But only a few chapters further in this book, he will speak more clearly, mentioning him by name and stating what his great work will be. The man is Cyrus the Mede. In chapter 45, we find these words, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him. Yes, King Cyrus will shake the coastlands. And chapter 41 is a prelude to what will be stated more explicitly in the next chapters. Babylon will become a mighty kingdom and replace Assyria. But it is a kingdom that will not last. Well, when Isaiah first spoke these words, it was unthinkable that another power would arise. Assyria was still the number one power. And Babylon was the new kid on the block as far as military power was concerned. And Judah wasn't worried about Persia at all, but about the rise of the kingdom of Babylon. And for good reason. For Isaiah had predicted in previous chapters that Babylon would bring them into exile, away from the promised land. And when a remnant was taken into exile, it didn't seem possible for Babylon the great to fall. And yet the Lord says it will happen. And the people of God must know it very specifically before any of these events take place. World events often happen in rapid succession, bringing great change. But there is always a reason why things happen the way they do, also in our world. And knowing this should knock fear and anxiety out of our system as children of God. By letting it be known that a great power will rise decades before it happened, the Lord challenges those he has called together to explain the rise and fall of world empires. Who gives this man from the East victory after victory? Well, by the mighty word of the Lord, they are torn loose from a closed world system where all they can think about is their own glory and their own military strength and power. The Lord makes clear here that the nations are part of a greater plan and have nothing to say unless He allows it. Who brings mighty kings and political forces to power? I, the Lord. Yes, I, the Lord, Yahweh, the one who has and continues to make myself known through my mighty deeds of salvation, I am who I am. The God of the covenant who revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush, 
disclosing to him how he would deliver his people out of the bondage and slavery of Egypt. He is the one who declares to the coastlands, to world leaders, that he and he alone is sovereign. And we need to keep in mind that in addressing the nations, the Lord indirectly speaks to Judah, to the church then and to the church of all ages. We, we too must realize that present events are but a small segment of the whole. You are living one chapter in a great big book of history. And if you lift that chapter out of the book, you will miss the point. And we need to hear this, don't we? As we face times of tension, moral disintegration, and spiritual indifference, I, the Lord. What a tremendous answer. And those three words are already enough to change our world, our viewpoint, and how we speak about what is going on in our world. In our country and in the country south of the border, Christians have become a divided house because the Christian faith has become highly politicized. And how we treat fellow brothers and sisters is poured through the sieve of our political opinions rather than through what we believe regarding Jesus Christ and his rule. I, the Lord. Beloved, when we take those words seriously, our attitudes, our perspectives, our opinions need to change. To say it bluntly, we need to shut up. And we need to shut out the noise of those clamoring for our attention. And we are to listen to what the Lord is saying to us. I, the Lord, the Lord of the covenant, our God, he controls the course of history, including what we see happening before our eyes today. And to think otherwise is a vote of non-confidence in the sovereign Lord Almighty. I, the Lord. If that were all the Lord said, it would already be enough. But he says more. I, the Lord, the first. God says, not only the latest developments are in my hand, but all of history is controlled by me from the very beginning. Yahweh is the first in that he is the director of human history. He was there in the beginning, and all things flow forth from him and are governed by him. The Lord, the covenant God. He writes history with his own hand. Well, beloved, will you trust him to do so? History is his story. And even though history may appear to be controlled by evil individuals, God declares himself to be the first. He's in charge of it all. And he lets, thing ha lets things happen for his own divine purpose to deliver and to save, to test and reprove and to punish. Each page of history is an indication that he is true to himself, his reputation, his purpose, his redemption. Babylon came to power to punish unbelief and rebellion among God's people. And Cyrus is made victorious so that Judah, as the people of God, should be set free. 
And when these words were spoken, Judah still had to go into exile in punishment for their sins. But to their comfort, they are given a glimpse into the events which will take place. The Lord who is the first is working until the fullness of time. He determines the course of history in order that his son, Jesus Christ, might be born in Bethlehem. And therefore, he makes every second count as an important one. Let the nations listen. Let the church take heed. God's counsel will be executed and his covenant maintained throughout each passing generation. The Lord who is the first is leading all things to the final moment of history, of world history, to the second coming of Christ. So everything you see happening around you today and every news item that plays a part in God's ongoing plan that will lead to judgment and condemnation of the wicked and the salvation of those who are His. The book of Revelation tells us that these last days will not be easy for the church. But it is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who opens the seals of the book and reveals its contents and shows Himself to be in control of history. Well, will you keep that in mind? When you talk about what is going on locally, nationally, and internationally, the Lord, our covenant God, sets out the course of history with a view to His plan of salvation in Christ. Well, why then fear? Nations indeed rise up against the Lord and His anointed. But he who sits in the heavens laughs and holds them in derision. The reins of the world are not in the hands of world leaders or dark forces. Yahweh, our covenant God, rules the world through his son Jesus Christ. The Lord is making great progress today as he moves one step closer to the fulfillment of his goal. For not only does he govern and control the course of history, he also brings it to its conclusion. That's our second point. And this is what is revealed to us in the words, and with the last, I am he. Now we may have expected another formulation, namely that God would say, I, the Lord, the first and the last. Because this is what you find most often. For example, in chapter 44, verse 6, we read, Thus is the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. And Revelation 1 echoes these words. Jesus, appearing to John on Patmos, says, Fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. And Christ repeats this in the last chapter of Revelation where he describes himself as, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. But our text is slightly different. God says, I, the Lord, the first and with The last, I am he. The Lord is the first. He was there from the beginning, and he will be there for future generations to the very last generation and purpose. And the Lord adds the words, I am he, at this particular point to indicate how he will manifest himself at the conclusion of history. He will appear at the end of time as the same God for the last individuals living on this world 
as the one who created the world. I am the same God who was there in the beginning. I stay the one and same Lord from generation to generation. And God makes a special point of letting the nations know He is the same. He will not change. How different He is from their gods. Idols are here today and gone tomorrow. Where are the gods of the Assyrians and the Egyptians and the Babylonians today? Many things will happen before the words with the last are fulfilled. The Lord who brought his people out of the land of slavery to set them free will drive them out of the promised land to punish them for their sin and rebellion. And he does so because he is true to his word of salvation and judgment, of promise and demand. And all these things happen because the Lord is unchangeable in his purpose and plan, in his words and works. His judgments are also part of his plan to redeem for himself a people chosen to everlasting life. He is consistent and trustworthy and unchangeable in his ways. And when the Lord made it clear to the nations that he controls history and brings it to its proper conclusion, the coastlands were afraid. The ends of the earth trembled. But there's no thought of repentance or turning from idols. Rather, they try to offer to each other encouragement to remain firm in old ways. They seek strength in their common brotherhood and they request help from the idols they themselves have constructed. Beloved, this is the tragic story of human history, of humanity. Mankind cannot do without God and yet they will not look to God for support, help, and light. They long for a better world. They're sick and tired of what's going on. And they look in all directions for this. But they do not turn to the living God. Because they are enslaved to their own patterns of life. And if one fails them, then they look for something or someone else to lean on. And to give them a sense of security. I, the Lord, the first and with the last. While those words comfort the church immensely, they comfort us. For the Lord is the same in his judgments, but also in his promises. And therefore, he says, starting at verse 8, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corner, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. And aren't these words music to our ears too? For the Lord, the first, is with the last. The same promise which, promises which he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob apply in the time of exile. And for the church today. And all the elect to the very last child to be born before Christ returns. God's promises do not and will not change to the end of time. Well, will you keep that in mind, brothers and sisters, as you talk about the present and future with each other and with your children? Don't waste your time 
or drive yourself crazy by listening to all those who have their answers ready to explain the mess in our world, but who disregard the Lord. Even in these times of grave foreboding, let us not turn to what can get us depressed and down or smug in our views, but let us turn to the holy book and to him who holds the key to history. For in Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, we find lasting joy and eternal hope. Amen.